Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Welcome to another episode of Hunt Talk Radio, uh, or as some of us call it, Randy Newberg Unfiltered. Uh, today is one of these warm, lovely days in early June in Bozeman, Montana, where I really wish I was out fishing. Um, but unfortunately with the TV show, everything else, the fishing has to wait and the walleyes are safe for today. But uh, anyhow, thanks for tuning in. I have kind of a, a different idea here today, and it came based on some ideas out on our Hunt Talk forum. Uh, a lot of you are chiming in out there, giving us some really cool ideas about things that, that we should be talking about on the podcast. So I'm I'm trying to cover some of those and, and do it in a way that makes sense. And this one here is, there now that most of the tags in the West have been drawn and we all have most of our results, not all of them, uh, a lot of people have emailed me, some have posted out on Hunt Talk asking me, all right, you have a tag, how do you go about scouting from home? Because I live in Michigan and I can't drive out to Colorado or Montana, I don't have the vacation time, the cost, blah, blah, blah. And in, in a lot of my seminars, I talk about how you can do a lot of this from home and I'm hoping that this podcast gives you some thoughts and ideas that they're not science. They're, they're not the only way to do it. It's the way Randy does it. Third person again. It's the way I do it. Um, and hopefully if you listen to uh, the way I do it, you might say, hey, Newberg, you've lost your mind. Or you might look at it, listen to it and say, huh, I hadn't thought about that before. So that that's the hope of this. And I'm going to kind of start go from start all the way to finish and you're going to hear me talk about a bunch of our youtube stuff at the same time because we're really trying to get the hunt talk forum our youtube channel which is randy newberg hunter and this podcast all to be kind of three trying uh, three parts of a triangle here where the same information is available in different locations and also maybe a slightly different slant on the topic so um, before we get going though, uh, and you're going to hear about me talk about a couple of these companies while I, I discuss my strategy and plan of how I do this, what I call desk scouting or e-scouting. Um, in fact, right now I'm standing here at my desk, so we'll call it desk scouting today. Uh, but Onyx Maps, uh, most of you know that they're one of the sponsors of this podcast. Great company. I've been using their products since I started, um, if you go to onyxmaps.com, the, they have a promo code right now, Randy16, R-A-N-D-Y-1-6. And if you use that with their new hunt app, you're going to get 20% off. And uh, I, I'm going over to their office uh, next week, and we're going to do some video stuff. We're going to do a whole bunch of stuff that gives you an idea of how I use their system to go from maybe a unit if you look at it on a paper map, it's, I don't know, two feet by three feet. And when I'm all done with their software and with their, their system, I've got that six square feet of map space, which represents however many, you know, square miles of hunting terrain. But I've got that chiseled down to not much left. So when I go there through, through my e-scouting and desk scouting, I've eliminated most of the unit. So when I get there, I'm pretty focused. I have a plan. I know what I'm doing. So onxmaps.com, use the promo code RANDY16. Uh, Orion Coolers, uh, great, great group of people who make some fantastic coolers. I did go fishing last week and uh, thought, ah, I'm going to try them out and see how good they work when I go fishing. And uh, they work just as good when I'm fishing as they do when I'm out hunting. Um Go follow them on Facebook Go to or go to oriancoolers.com. Uh, follow them on Instagram. Their Instagram hashtag is keep your cool. Or no, it's uh, don't lose your cool. I'm sorry on that. Uh, yeah, Orion Coolers hashtag don't lose your cool. Uh, they just, yeah, I'm so impressed with those coolers. And uh, they live the life we live. We live. They, they know what we're all about. They understand the public land gig. Uh they understand the whole hunting gig. So it's, it's nice to be, uh, using coolers and products by people who, who really get what we do. 
Uh, and then the last sponsor of the podcast here I want to talk about is the, the folks at GoHunt.com. You've heard me talk about many times, not just here on the podcast, but out on our Hunt Talk forum, out on the, the uh, Elk Talk series we're doing on YouTube. You hear me talk about it there. They have this service called The Insider. And if you go to GoHunt.com, click on the button that says Insider, and it's got so much detail. I spend hours and hours and hours out there planning our hunts for the fall, planning our application process, looking at draw odds, looking at precipitation patterns. It, there's just so much there. And uh, if you join the Insider service, uh, use the promo code Hunt talk h-u-n-t-t-a-l-k and if you do you're going to get the new vital blade knife the the skirt the gerber scalpel blade knife uh, it's the one you see us using out in the field uh just for signing up gerber's going to give you one of those if you become a member of the go hunt insider so with that um if you hear some tapping here it's that my microphone i'm i'm trying to well Let's face it, men aren't good at multitasking, but I'm trying to do it. So I'm trying to scroll through my computer, go to all these websites that I have open, all these tabs in front of me, and talk about each of these processes. So if my mic bangs on the desk, uh, apologies in advance. But uh, so, uh, like I said, so many people ask, how do you guys plan these hunts from home? Because I live in Montana, and other than Montana, every state I go to, it's, it's something I got to be doing at my desk. And thanks to a lot of the tools that are out there now, you can do a, so much digital scouting from just from your, your desk. And uh, see, as, as I was doing this, I already hit the wrong button and I just closed like three tabs on my computer. I'm, I think I need an assistant for this, but anyhow, Point being is, in today's world, there is so much that you can do from your desk that when you get there, you can be very efficient in the remainder of your time. And so I, I almost have to start at the very beginning. I, it comes right down to, all right, what species am I going to hunt? Obviously, that's huge determination. But for this example, and when we get to the end of this whole podcast and I tell you what we're doing on YouTube, you'll know why I decided to use an elk hunt as an example. And uh, for, for what I'm walking through here, we're going to replicate how I researched an elk hunt that's going to be a YouTube-only uh, episode that airs in late June, June 27th is when we're going to have it live on YouTube. And the... The process I'm talking about here is pretty much the process I used for that hunt. I had never been in this unit. I'd never, I'd driven by it. That's it. I'd never got off the main highway. Uh, even though it's in my home state of Montana, it could have just as well been in Idaho or New Mexico. So w the, the first thing that I go to is, all right, what state am I going to apply for? Um, a lot of you, that's going to be driven by, all right, I have points or I don't have points. If you have points, you're probably going to keep applying in the state you've built points. If you don't have points, you're probably going to look to one of the states that don't have point, point systems, and those would be Idaho and New Mexico. Or maybe you're going to do one of the over-the-counter options. You're going to buy a leftover tag, whatever. A lot of times that also is determined by what weapon you want to use. So for elk... I often tell people if, if you're going to hunt elk with a rifle, that's a completely different hunt than if you're going to do it with a bow. And the state you would choose as your first choice, for me anyhow, when I'm answering that question, I will, tell my, I will answer the question differently if they tell me, oh, I'm a bow hunter, or they tell me I'm a rifle hunter. If they tell me they're an archery hunter and they don't have any points, I'm going to tell them, you need to buy a Montana leftover elk tag. And they look at me like, why? And I tell them that in Montana, during the archery season of September, the elk are up high. Well, the high country in Montana is the public land. The low valleys are the private land. So if you don't want to have to deal with the whole access hassle, go there in the archery season. Now, if you tell me you're a rifle hunter, 
I'm probably going to send you to Colorado. I might send you to Idaho. Places where the, the sanctuary effect of the low country is not quite what it is in Montana. So, again, I'm, I'm just walking through this whole kind of decision tree you got to go through. So once you decide what state it is, then it's like, okay, what state am I going, or what area within that state will I apply, or which state, area within the state am I going to hunt if it's an over-the-counter or general tag? And then what season, uh, when I say season, I'm talking about early season, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, late season. Which of those five hunt periods will I be hunting either because that's the tag I applied for and drew or because I bought a general tag and that's just when I want to go. So the, all of those are, are huge factors. And, and the reason that I, I always focus on these five periods, if you go out to our YouTube channel, there's a series that we're doing there with the elk, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation called Elk Talk. And I, in there, I've done the best I can to try take the system of how I analyze each of these five periods of the elk season, whatever you want to call it, season period segments. And they, they have a different calendar than we do. They don't care about August, September, October, November, December. They care about, is it the early season? Is it the pre-rut? Is it the peak rut? Is it the post rut? Or is it the late season? Because in every one of those seasons, they have different needs and they're going to go to different locations to satisfy the need they have in that particular period. So where you find elk in the early season, when food is priority, is going to be in a completely different spot than where you find them in the post-rut or late period when the sanctuary is a priority. So I start right there. And I don't care if it's elk, if it's mule deer, whatever it is. I sit down and say, what period of the animal's calendar are they going to be in when I'm there hunting? Because even, and I gave you those five periods for, for elk. Those same, same five periods apply for, for deer. You know, they, they just fall at different points in the human calendar. But deer have the same type of situation where in the early season, they're going to be in one spot. In the pre-rut, they're going to start moving towards the areas where the peak rut is. In the peak rut, they're going to be near the female. Post-rut, they're probably getting out of Dodge, hiding to get away from hunters. And in the late season, you can't ever find them. It's, so it, I start that way, even though this is an elk hunt. If it were a, a deer hunt, uh, maybe even an antelope hunt, I, I would look at it. I, I the the period I'm hunting would determine how I'm going to go down the rest of this path here. Ah, the bad part about being the only guy on the podcast is you got to talk twice as much. So you get twice as thirsty, but so uh, back to those five periods that determines everything going forward. Once you know the season or the calendar period, you're going to be hunting your map work becomes a whole lot easier. And I'm, I'm going to get into map work because uh, whether it's a paper map or a digital map, whatever you use, that is what I live by. That is the game plan. That map tells me everything I'm going to do. There's going to be notes, tick marks, colors, patterns, all of which have a specific purpose, a specific reason for being there. And I, I, I could have a map of, uh, let's just say, Unit 10 in Arizona. And that map would look one color and one shape if I was hunting Unit 10 in the peak rut. And it would have all kinds of different colors and shapes and diagrams if I was hunting the same unit, but I was hunting the late season. So you, a lot of people are like, man, you got a lot of maps here for Unit 16A in New Mexico. Yeah, that's because one time I hunted it in the peak rut. One time I hunted it in the late season and <laughs> I didn't want to mess up my one paper map by re-diagramming everything on the other paper map. So point is, now that I know what season I'm hunting, what period of the, of the elk calendar I'm going to be there, now life starts getting a whole lot more focused. And I, 
I'm going to try explain this, and I don't know if it works good by just talking about it. We are going to going to shoot some video about this so that out on YouTube you can get a better feel for it. And when we're out in the field this year, I'm going to try talk about it more because it's something I take for granted about how I approach it. And my camera guys are like, Randy, you got a pretty defined system here that you follow. You should be telling the audience about this. I'm like, oh, really? Huh. <laughs> okay, it's just a, a system developed from years and years of failure. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> you know, if what do they say that uh, failure is the best uh, step towards success? Well, I should be well into success then by as many failures as I've had when it comes to alkying. But so I, I, I'm using four main tools, three, probably three main tools when I'm doing this, and then another one just as a sounding board. Now I'll, I'll get to those, but. When I have my map either on my computer screen or on my floor, I'm looking for, and I'm assuming when I go there, it's like for you, you, you might have a different schedule than I do, but I'm going there for five days. I have five days of hunting that I can be there. Usually I show up at a place I've never been to, and in five days, I've got to figure out where the elk are. And I try to have a morning spot and an evening spot. So, uh, and I want to have one for each of those days. So that means I've got 10 spots on my map. And I might actually have 20 or 30 spots in consideration, but they're, these 10 spots are not like absolute GPS coordinates. They're drainages or basins or slopes or hillsides that have general characteristics of what I'm looking for. And if I have 10 of those, it's probably going to take me most of the hunt to weed them all out. And each of them are chosen for a certain purpose. Uh, it's chosen because the season date that or season period I'm hunting might be, and I'll use this example of the video that's going to launch out on YouTube at the end of the month. That's a post rut hunt. Well, in post rut, post rut, I know sanctuary is primary. That is, they're looking to get away from hunting pressure at this time. So my 10 spots are going to be primarily places bulls go to get away from hunting pressure. And that means away from roads and trails. Maybe it's a far distance. Maybe it's just steep, ugly terrain. There's probably going to be small pockets feed nearby, a little bit of water, but I don't really care if there's a cow within 20 miles of where I'm going to be. I'm looking for a public land bull, a mature public land bull. I'm not looking for the young bulls that are with the cows still. And when I say this post rut period, I'm talking like, oh, October, sometime mid-October to the end of October. Once I get to November 1st, I usually, my mind switches, okay, that's late season. And, uh, Late season gets to be a little bit easier of a time to find elk than, than post-rut. To me, post-rut is the hardest time to find elk on public land. And that's why all the western states, for the most part, have a lot of their rifle seasons in the post-rut period. Success rates are really low. Well, why are success rates really low? Because it's a tough time to find and kill elk. If you're killing elk consistently in the post-rut period... You are on top of it. You've got it figured out. Don't tell anybody what you're doing because you've got some good stuff going on. So I got these 10 spots on my map. And all of them have slightly different features. But they all have some common features. And the common features that they have are that they all are reflective of they will fulfill the need an elk has in the late late rut or the post rut period in other words sanctuary so that's a common thing among all of these and so when, again when you think about sanctuary it's probably distance topography or something that keeps hunters away but then each of the spots all 10 of them will have a slight variation to them and it might be because i well Half of the spots, before I get into the variations, half of my spots are going to be spots I consider morning spots. And the other half are going to be spots I think are better afternoon spots. And I'm sure some of you are like, well, what's the difference? 
Um, and maybe there isn't any difference. Maybe it's just me and my little pea brain finds more comfort in hunting certain spots as morning spots or other places as afternoon spots because I've had success there, success breed confidence, and maybe just through randomization or coincidence, I've started patterning, patterning my hunting to hopefully continue uh, having success in those places in the morning. So now that I've, <clears throat> I've got 10 spots, all kind of spots I know are going to have some attributes that help uh, a bull elk find sanctuary in the, the post-rut period. And I know half of them are morning spots, half of them are afternoon spots. Now we get into, all right, what are the small variations to these? And some of it, it will be based on slope. I, I want some north slope, some west slope, and some east slope. Very seldom am I hunting south slopes. I mean, I, I might do that in a late season hunt when it's cold and nasty. But for the other four periods of the year, I'm usually hunting east slopes, west slopes, or north slopes. So among these 10 spots I have, there's going to be some difference in slopes, which way they face. There's going to be some difference in their elevation because I, I might have it in my mind. All right, the elk are going to be up at 9,000 feet. And if all my spots are at 9,000 feet, but the, el the weather or hunting pressure or drought or something has brought elk down lower to 7,400 feet, I'm wasting my time and I don't have anything, any backup plan. So I just use these as examples of what these variables might be. Um, it, you know, the, a place I hunt in Colorado, there's some places I want to have a few spots in the pinion juniper. I want to have a few spots up in the oak transition range. I want to have a few spots in the aspens that are just right above the oaks. And then I might have another spot or two way up high, way in the dark, you know, alpine kind of dark timber. I want to have enough options so that when I get there, I, d I haven't put all my eggs in one basket. That every day I'm going to be looking at something a little bit different that I still am confident will meet the needs of a bull elk in that period. And it's, <laughs> I wish I could say that, oh, there's all these certain characteristics and, and you got to have this and you got to have that. But we all know that every piece of elk habitat is different. And through trial and error, mostly error, I've found places that maybe it's my style of hunting, that certain places look better. Uh, certain places seem to yield better success. Maybe it's, it is for some biological or ecological reason that those places produce better. Uh, but the, the places I have to choose from on my map in Montana might be completely different than the op options I have on my map in a same size unit in New Mexico. So it, it's, as you're starting to, to gather, I'm sure is it's, it's not this consistent, easy, everything is just a check the box, A, B, C, one, two, three kind of thing. It's, it, it is definitely an art less than, uh, more, it's an art more so than it is a science. So now I've, let's just assume I have this big paper map out here. <clears throat> Usually it's a digital map, but I'm just going to say I got a big paper map and Wherever the roads are, I, as, since this is a late season or post rut you know, or late season, either one, in those hunts, I'm going to take a marker and I'm just kind of making these squiggle marks where any road that is open during this period to motorized travel, I'm, I got a squiggle mark that's about a mile off each side of that road. Unless there's some serious topo lines that I know, okay, those topo lines right next to the road, no one's going to park there and climb that cliff. Um, you, you can bet that those are crossed off my map. And then I know there are certain other places that, okay, in this late period hunt, this post rut hunt, whatever it, it is in that time after the rut, these elk are not going to be in the high country. They're, they're going to be in places where maybe they, they're in the transition from the high country to the winter range. I know that there's not going to be the, 
what would I say? The almost the conspicuous elk that stands there and says, Hey, I'm going to bugle. Come hunt me. So I'm, I'm looking at this stuff saying, all right, what, what do each of these spots on this map have, as I talked about earlier, I want 10 of them. Where can I find 10 spots on this map after I've crossed off all the travel issues that I think are going to push elk into sanctuary areas? Well, that very first step of kind of getting rid of all the terrain that's near a road or a trail, by the time I'm done with that, this map I was explaining that was two feet by three feet, I've probably eliminated in in some of the units that are heavily roaded, I've eliminated 80 to 90 percent of the map potential. In areas that are more backcountry areas, I've maybe already eliminated half of that unit. So right at my desk, I've eliminated about half of the unproductive ground, which gets me way further down the road than if I just showed up there and said, oh man, I wonder how this is going to work. wonder what that looks like. So that's, that's my process of trying to find these 10 spots that I want to have in my mind. And then spatially, as far as how they're spaced out, I've had people ask me, well, uh, do you want all of these 10 spots really close together so you can do a backpack hunt and hunt them all from your same uh, backpack camp? If, uh, if I am doing a backpack hunt, yeah, I got to have a spot that for my camp that I can get to all 10 of these places because I don't want to waste my hunting time pulling my camp, going somewhere else, setting my camp back up. Um, I, and usually, just because of production complications, cameras, charging batteries, how much gear we can actually carry, uh, most of our hunts are what I'd call base camp hunts, where we go to a trailhead, we set up a camp, and we might drive out there and go you know, three miles down the road and hike from there. So I would say most of these spots are not that far away there, or maybe... You know, if you drew a radius from where my my wall tent is set up, it might be five to six mile radius in any direction. All 10 spots usually fall within there. I just, if I can help it, I don't want to spend valuable time driving to far reaches of the unit or having to pull camps and move. And I want to be hunting. And through my desk scouting at my desk, I can find spots that allow me to hunt without having to, to waste time doing all that other stuff. So, so now that I've, I've kind of got these 10 spots on my map, I've picked them because I know I'm hunting the post rep period. I'm on public land. I know there's going to be hunting pressure. I know the elk are going to be in their sanctuaries. These 10 spots have a little bit of variability to them, but yet the consistent theme of they all meet the sanctuary requirement, which is the primary need of a bull elk in the post rut. And half of them are morning spots, half of them are afternoon spots. And now you've heard me say that a couple times now, so I'll just explain to you what, <clears throat> for me anyhow, represents a morning spot, what represents a, an afternoon spot. And you'll, when I, or the next piece I'm going to go into here talks about, okay, now that you have the 10 spots, how do I go about this day to day to day elimination of those 10 spots? And how do I use them when I'm out in the field? So uh, I'll just tell you how it works for me for morning spots. I like to have a morning spot that, and, and it depends on how much glassing I'm going to do and how open the country is, but if you think about, you know, how the sun rises and sets, we all know it rises in the east, sets in the west. Most often, west-facing slopes, the elk, my experience has been, they come out later in the afternoon on west-facing slopes. That, And I don't know if the reason then that the next morning, they're probably out later in the morning than they are in the east-facing slopes. I don't know if that's because, hey, they got a late start that afternoon, so they're out feeding longer. Or if it's just the fact that, all right, the west-facing slopes, the sun's not going to get there sooner or earlier, so they stay out later. It might be a combination of all those. It might be some reason I don't even know. But 
I want to have some places that I can glass into slopes that face west and slopes that face east. My west-facing slopes are going to be my morning locations. My east-facing slopes are going to be my afternoon locations. And again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's how I do it. Half of you listening might reverse that 180 degrees. I don't know. And uh, I'm not trying to look for for places where I'm looking directly west or directly east because then you find yourself glassing into the sun. Uh, And I don't like to do that. Some people say it doesn't bother them. I, I don't. So, but now... If, if we go through this day-by-day process of my five days, here's kind of how it works. And with the one caveat of I hope I can get there the day before season opens to set up my camp and scout that whole day. And if I can get there the evening, two, two evenings prior to season opening, so let's say season opens on a Monday, I want to be there Saturday night, get my camp set up, have all day Sunday to scout. If I can, I can't always do that. But if, if at all possible, I at least want that afternoon before season opens to have available as scouting time. I, I, and I tell a lot of people this, I I would give up two days of hunting for a day of scouting. That's how valuable that one scouting day will be. One, you get to know the lay of the land as much as you can look at it on Google earth and everything else. It's going to look different when you get there. There might have been a fire since the Google Earth image you looked at. There might be a road closure that's new this year. There's just so many things that you want to find those out before it's go time. You you don't want to show up and say, hey, we got to get up this basin and find out that the road has been closed or washed out or whatever four miles from where you thought the trailhead was. Because now you got four more extra miles to walk. And you're probably going to be late and it changes the whole logistics of everything you thought of doing. So those scouting days, if nothing else, even if you don't see any animals, just getting there to sort that out is for me anyhow, huge benefit. So if I can have that, that first day to scare that one day to scout, I treat my morning of that day, just like opening morning. I go into what I think are my best spots. And I'll hike in. I want to be there well before the sun comes up. And I'm going to be there that day before season opens because I want to see what the pattern of those elk are for that opening day. And the, <laughs> I also look at my, my hunt if I'm going there for the opening day. Sometimes I got to go there in the middle of the season so this doesn't apply and, and might not apply to you if, if you can't get there open, for the opening day. But... I divide hunting season into <clears throat> really two pieces. Opening day and everything after that. Opening day, you can pattern an elk. If you see them doing something in your scouting, they're probably going to do that the opening morning. You can probably go to school on that, and you can probably kill that bull opening morning. After the shooting starts, after people are walking around, stinking up the woods, car doors are slamming, and... And bullets bouncing off canyon walls. It's like a whole different season. It's almost like most of your scouting almost didn't mean anything for finding animals. I mean, it it just, it changes their behaviors that much. And so if I can, that more, that, let's again use that I got there Sunday morning, season opens on Monday. Sunday morning, I'm going to go and replicate exactly what I think is my best bet for Monday morning when season opens. And I'm going to go to hopefully a spot in in my map with a good spotting scope, good binoculars. From one spot, I want to have a location where I can glass up into two, maybe three of my spots from afar. I don't need to be right there on top of them. I want glassing spots where I can look and not disturb anything. I can cover everything and no, no, the elk are none the wiser. And sometimes you find them and you just kind of sit there and hope, oh gosh, I hope nobody else sees these before tomorrow morning. Um, and if that's the case, if I do find them, <clears throat> I will go in closer that evening and I will 
for, for two reasons. One, I'm going to go in there because I want to mark this trail to get in there. And I want to go in in the daylight when I can pick the easiest route. But I want it marked on my GPS. So the next morning, when I'm coming back in there, in the dark, way before the sun comes up, I've already got that trail marked on my GPS. So that's one of the reasons I go in there. Two, I want to go in there that evening and I want to see, are the elk still here? Because normally the pattern is, all right, in the morning they feed for a half hour till the sun kind of comes up. Within a half hour or so, they head for the timber. They go to bed. And if they're heavily pressured public land elk, like I'm usually hunting, they repeat the reverse of that. I guess they reverse that process in the afternoon. And I want to know, did those elk come back out that evening? If those elk came back out that evening, I'm getting out of there. I don't need to stay there until the absolute bitter end. They are there. I know where they're going to be generally. Hopefully in my scouting, I've looked around. I've found a, an opening, a rock pile, something that's going to give me some vision into where they're at in a shooting spot and a shooting angle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a hard time sleeping that night if that's what I've found. Very often, I don't find that. <laughs> so that, op- that, that first morning of scouting, a lot of times I, <clears throat> I haven't found any elk. So then I do on my scouting day, Sunday afternoon, I, I'm just, in the midday, I know I'm not going to see much. So the other part of my scouting is there's certain parts about glassing the areas. There's other parts of scouting that are logistics, lay of the landscape, where are the roads, trails, where's the hunting pressure, where are the other camps, all that other stuff. That's what I use my midday period for. And that scouting day, that midday period, I'm putting on some miles. I'm going around. I'm checking, all right, is there a camp in this basin? Is there that over there? Because so many things can mess up what was your plan from home. <clears throat> and then you get there and you find out, you know what? That basin that I thought was the watering source for these four drainages, there's a wall tent right in the middle of it. Or four guys hiked in there and there's four tents <laughs> pitched in in the middle of that basin. So in the middle of the day, since I know I'm not going to be seeing elk, my goal is go look around, make sure I understand as much as I can learn about the landscape in that period of time. And then, you know, before it'll be mid afternoon, it's not going to be close to the late wee hour. I want to go into a spot in the afternoon and try to do what I did in the morning. Even though, assuming in the morning I didn't see anything. In the afternoon, let's say two in the afternoon, I want to get in there well in advance. I'm going to go into one of these other spots I have on my map where I can maybe glass two to three locations that I've marked. And these are evening locations. They're probably going to be east-facing slopes so that the sun is going to go over to the west. And if there are elk, they're going to come out on these slopes earlier. So I'm going to be there that evening. And by leaving in the daylight, I get in there, I can mark it on my trail. And hopefully I see something. And a lot of times if, if that's when I see them, I don't get, they might be a mile away or three miles away in one of my spots. So I really haven't had a chance now to hike in in the daylight and mark that trail. And if that's the case, then I just got to leave earlier because we all know that hiking into new country in the dark without a a trail marked on your GPS is way, way slower going. You're going to take a wrong turn here and there. All kinds of things are going to happen. So if that's the case, I know that I better be planning to get up earlier than I really thought, than I probably really want. But if those elk were in that basin the night before, opening morning, I have a really good chance of killing one of them if I can get in there without them hearing me or smelling me. And that's, that, that would then be my plan for the next morning. So <clears throat> you can see that first day of scouting. That's why I would give up two days of hunting. In, in a day of scouting, I can cover so much ground and learn so much that it almost saves me the headache and hassle of what I would learn in two days of hunting. So 
let's assume that I didn't see anything in my one day of scouting. Well, now at least I've, cro- I've crossed off at least one of my afternoon spots, maybe two of them. I've crossed off one of my morning spots, maybe two of them. And I've probably, because there's variation to all of them, I've probably learned something about the spots that are maybe a little higher in elevation, a little lower in elevation. I maybe learned something about the ones that are a little bit east facing or northeast facing, the ones that are west or northwest facing. And I will tell you this, that <laughs> there, there, there are some resources out there on the, on the World Wide Web, thanks to whoever invented that, uh, that, uh, and for me, this, you, and you see it in the show. A lot of people notice this, but a lot don't. But if there is a burn anywhere near where I'm hunting, that's one of my spots. For elk hunting, if there's a burn that's been there in the last six years, if it's six years or newer, that burn is going to be one of my spots. And I can glass that burn, maybe half of it, I can make it an afternoon spot because of the way the the slope runs and maybe the other side of it or the other half of it, I can make it a morning spot. So I'm sitting here scrolling through my computer as I'm talking and I... It, it just dawned on me to remember to say that, hey, if, if all things are being equal, if the mountain, all mountains are of the same shape, design, and orientation, I'm going to the mountain that has a burn on it before I'm going anywhere. It just, and we all know why. I mean, the nutrient value in those burns is far beyond anything else. A lot of times you get these mosaic patterns that within these burns where some of that timber didn't burn. A lot of times if it's big burns, there's some ugly, nasty country there that people don't want to go through, or it's, you know, a three-year-old burn and a lot of the burned trees are now falling down and it's not any fun. Those are places that big bulls love to hang out on public land. And it's, I, I can assure you that <clears throat> any place I hunt, if it has a burn, it's, it's on my map as a, as a place to look. So, Oh man, I'm talking too much. <clears throat> so, uh, I've spent a lot of day, a lot of time on that first scouting day if I can get it. Uh another little tidbit for me and it might not work for you because of calendars and schedules, you might not be able to select as much as as I can be selective in in what days I hunt. My goal is I would if I got 5 days I want to hunt Monday through Friday. Um one, yeah, I do want to avoid the weekend pressure if I can, but I can't always do that. A lot of times I can't. A lot of times the season dates cover the weekend and three other days. So that's what I have to do. But given the choice, I would rather hunt Monday through Friday because on Monday, the weekend pressure has, <clears throat> excuse me, by Monday, the weekend pressure has moved the elk into even tighter holes, into spots that are even harder to get to. So if I know season's already been open and there's been weekend pressure and I'm going there and my first day to hunt is Monday, I'm going to look at the spots that are the nastiest and ugliest of all the pieces on my map. By Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the woods have calmed down. The elk are a little bit less on guard. They're wanting to feed a little bit more. I'll hunt different spots just based on that. So again, those are just a couple little things that go into this five day uh, spot by spot, day by day plan that I, I try to execute when I go out there. So let's assume I've not seen anything in my scouting, but I've been able to eliminate a couple spots. Opening morning for me, I have to sit, sit down and assess. All right. What did I learn in my scouting day? Okay. I didn't see anything high. Maybe I went low. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to check some spots that are a little in this mid mid band this elevation that's not the high stuff i have on my map the low or the low stuff so opening morning is uh, i'm maybe down to eight spots or seven spots at this time and again i'm going into the spot i think is the best looking from what i saw scouting at home uh, and what i've learned in my one day of scouting <clears throat> if it's a drought year everything I saw on Google Earth might be completely different because of the drought. Or if it's a really wet year, everything might be completely different. And so, again, I'm going to go in opening morning. 
I've probably got four morning spots left based on their orientation. I'm going to pick the one I think, obviously, I'm going to pick the one I think is the best of the remaining four. And I'm going to go in there and I'm going to try to glass as many places as I can from one spot. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when I'm glassing that, I, I know there's a very good chance if I see an elk, I'm not going to be able to get to them because I'm not going to go in there in the dark, especially a new spot I've not been to. I'm not going in there in the dark and going to get super, super close to them because noise and wind, I'm probably going to booger them. And if you mess it up with a, a post rut or a late season bull, you probably only get one chance at that bull and he's moving on. He's going someplace else. He knows he's been discovered. That's why you see when we're doing these hunts on our, on our TV show, so often you see us behind the, the optics. You know, you'll see the little Leupold spotter there just about every, <laughs> every shot when we're elk hunting in these, these time periods. Here's Randy standing there with his spotting scope. So, and even my camera guys, I, give, I load them up with binoculars, and they have their own binoculars. And I tell them, look, guys, this is a, a, a very optic-oriented game. This is very visual. And we're, we're glassing from afar. So when I go in that opening morning, I don't have the expectation that I'm going to find a bull and kill it that morning. Maybe I'll luck out and I will. Maybe it'll be in a place close enough that I can get to before they go to their bed. But most often that opening morning, I'm looking for an elk. I see them if I'm lucky. And they go and they bed and they don't get disturbed. That tells me, here's your afternoon plan. My first afternoon plan then is I'm going in there one or two in the afternoon. I'm hiking in. I'm getting in a position where when that bull comes out to feed in the evening, I'm going to be there to kill him. I'm going in quiet. I can see where I'm going. I can get in there a lot easier. And even if I don't find him that evening, I at least have marked the trail on my GPS. So if I want to go back in the next morning, I can do it. And I can do it easily because now the trail is marked. So if, if I don't find anything that opening morning, then it's kind of a repeat of that scouting day. All right. Kind of cross these spots off my map. I don't, <clears throat> I don't literally like cross them off with a big marker. I just kind of mentally say, all right, I've been there. Uh, it didn't work today. Slide it down to the bottom of the list, move some further up the list. So then my second day, or my, I guess it'd be my second afternoon in the unit, which is opening afternoon, <clears throat> afternoon of opening day. Um, if I haven't seen anything opening morning, I'm going to do some more of this legwork of driving roads, checking to see where hunting pressure is, other stuff like that. But by two in the afternoon, I'm on a trail going to what I think is a good evening location to glass. And I'm going to go see what I can find. Again, if I see a bull in an evening location, there's a very good chance I'm not going to be able to kill that bull that night because he's far away. Maybe I luck out and I can. But if nothing else, I see him and the next morning, I'm going to have to get up super, super early to get in there to try to kill that bull. And if it's a spot that I'm so worried that, you know what, I can't get in there in the dark to kill this bull. Uh, I'll either wind will, will mess it up or noise or blow down or whatever. I might go back to the same spot <clears throat> that morning where I'd glass the evening before. And I'll just glass that basin again to make sure that bull is still there. If he is, then I know that the next afternoon I can get in there and we kill a lot of the elk that we kill in the afternoon because we glass them in the morning or we've glassed them the evening before. And we wait, <clears throat> we wait until we know we can get in there without spooking them because we don't get a lot of, lot of opportunities. And you think about it, there's me, maybe another hunter, there's two camera guys, all the noise, all the scent, all the movement, everything else. We got to make sure that when we go after an elk, we've got the setup, we've got the wind, we've got the everything in our favor. So I may be a little more patient those first two or three days than, 
than you guys would have to be. So that's kind of how, how this process keeps repeating itself the, for the scouting day, the first day, the second day, even into the third day. And it's very seldom that we get to the third day and we haven't found the elk, but to, <laughs> when it happens, it's, it's like, uh oh, now what? <clears throat> I only got two days left. And it's, it's very tempting to hit the panic button after, after the third day. Because, you know, all right, I've got two more mornings and two more afternoons, and I haven't really found anything yet. <clears throat> Often we have found them, uh, or we've, we've found enough patterns of either what they're doing or what they aren't doing that we can eliminate a lot of, lot of variables, a lot of possibilities. And usually by the, night of the third night of the hunt, me, the camera guys, the guest hunter, we're sitting down, we're just kind of going over this almost like game plan checklist of, all right, <clears throat> what did we see? What didn't we see? Did we see any sign here? Did we see any elk there? What, where's the hunting pressure? It just a whole list of things. And then we lay that next to all of these spots we have marked. And sometimes it is, we, if we've laid it out right, sometimes we can cover all 10 spots by the third day, especially if we have one day of scouting. And then we're, you're at this crossroads of, okay, do I just go kind of shooting in the dark here for, <clears throat> for lack of a better term of just randomly picking some new places, or do I go back through this milk route of places and hit them again and give them another chance and give them another chance. And most often I will go back to the same places that, okay, maybe in my scouting day, I didn't see anything that morning, but it was the first place on my list for a reason it had all these features, all these benefits. I'm going back there, even though in the scouting day, I didn't see it. So we keep doing that process. And, and that's really how we work through this. And I, I can't, I, maybe, maybe uh, uh, those of you who've hunted probably do understand, but the temptation for me with all we've got riding on an episode to hit the panic button after the third day is pretty tempting. But what I have found, I found a couple things. One, if I don't hit the panic button, usually things work out. The other thing I've found is I, I'm always worried that, all right, I'm here for five days. There might only be one group of elk in this basin or two groups of elk in this basin. I kind of tiptoe around the edges to start with. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm pretty passive because I, I want to have these elk stay here and be able to play the cat and mouse game with them for all five days. Well, usually on the, on the fourth day, <clears throat> if we haven't got them yet, I just switch gears. I go from like granny gear, first gear to overdrive. And sometimes I've seen the camera guys and the guest owners look at me like, holy cow, he's a completely different dude today. And what it is, is I know I can be as aggressive as I want. Now, I've only got two days left. And it's amazing how when I get more aggressive, a lot of times we get more encounters <laughs> and we get more elk. I, so you think that would tell you, hey, knucklehead, get more aggressive right from the start? <clears throat> and I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to get myself to that point of losing my fear of, of bumping these elk and pushing them over three ranges away or two basins away. And just get after it right from the beginning. But I usually don't because what I said earlier is if, if that bull smells you or that, that bachelor herd of bulls smell you, they're, they're gone. And the odds of you catching up to them again are really, really slim. They're, they're going some other place. They've found some other sanctuary that they know of. And that's where they're going to go that night when it gets dark. So uh, there, there is some relief that comes in that last, you know, day four and day five in that, you know, that if you screw it up, I mean, I mean there's the, the frustration that'll come with screwing it up, but there's the relief of knowing that, Hey, you know what? If I screw it up, I screw it up. It's not like I've got another week to hunt after this. I'm going for it. <clears throat> and 
in this, this situation of hunting public lands, that's just how you got to do it. You know, it, you, you have to gauge based on your experience, based on what time of the season it is, how passive or how aggressive you want to be. If I've went into a basin or a group of basins and there's no other people hunting, I'm probably pretty passive until I see that bull. If there are people walking all over, I'm probably a little more aggressive because I'm like, you know what? If I don't shoot that bull, and even if I bump them, as many people as are walking around here, they're probably going to bump them and move them into the next county. So <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of things that will determine where on the spectrum of passive aggressive I am in my hunting behavior. But for sure, by after three days are gone, I am super aggressive in my hunting behavior. So <clears throat> anyhow, that's... I, I just wanted to walk through that process of, of how we do it for a five-day hunt because I, I, I don't know. It took me a long time to really sit down and analyze what's a good way to do this. What, what's the best use of my time when I'm out there? And a lot of times I'll talk to, to guys who have a, a paying job and so they don't get to hunt elk as much as I do. Um, and I see just you know and I don't mean this in any condescending way it's just over time when I get to hunt elk five or six times a year I start developing these patterns and I I see guys show up and there's just a, a huge amount of randomness to where they're going and why they're going there and and I get that because I was there I and you'd think as much elk hunting experience as I have I'd kill a lot more of them <laughs> but I don't uh but <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping that for those of you who are listening to this, maybe you live someplace where you only get to do one elk hunt a year or maybe every few years. I, I'm trying to lay it out. Here's how you can be more effective with your time. Here's how you can have an approach that if you lay it out that way and you've put a lot of homework into it, you're going to be more confident in that plan when you get there. And if you're more confident in that plan, the odds are you're going to stick with it and you're going to follow it to the end. And I think you're going to have way better odds of killing an elk in that situation. So, man, <coughs> sorry about this. I'm about ready to vapor lock here. But so uh, we have a, a lot of this. Uh, the The first parts of this have been explained in uh, out on our YouTube channel. We have this, like I said earlier, this elk talk series, and it's done with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and we, we talk about the five patterns or five seasonal periods. And now we're, we're starting to get into the videos that you'll see us loading up pretty soon. Get into some of this other stuff I just talked about. Uh, get into the idea of how do you plan your five days. And, and if you got seven days, hey, better yet. You know, if you got two weeks, <laughs> even better yet. But <clears throat> not a lot of guys have that. So that's why I usually try to break it down into these five-day ideas. And and with that, on <clears throat> on the Elk Talk series, you're you're going to hear us talk about this stuff. We're going to get into equipment. Uh, we're going to get into all kinds of things. And one of the things I'm hoping that all of you will do is you'll go out to our Hunt Talk forum, hunttalk.com. And we have a thread about YouTube topics that people want to hear more of or guests they want us to have. And I take for granted a lot of what we do out there. It's just... You know, when when you have my situation and you go on these many hunts, uh, you really do take a lot for granted as to how many different places that the audience has hunted elk or how, what seasons or all that. <clears throat> and I I'm looking for people to kind of say, hey Randy, this you know this is important. This uh, I got a question on this. I want a question on that. So if you would go out to hunttalk.com and in the segment of the forum about the podcast, uh, if, if you would, I, I'd appreciate any thoughts that you have about information you, you think we could help with as it relates to elk hunting. Uh, and that's why the whole series is called, uh, elk talk because it's, we're talking about elk hunting. That's, that's really all we have in that series. It's all talking about elk talk or elk hunting. So, and one of the, the benefits, you know, I told you on June 27th, 
we're going to launch this or load up on our YouTube channel. YouTube channel is called Randy Newberg, comma, Hunter. And like I often say, it's free, so please subscribe. Have your friends subscribe. <clears throat> but that hunt is going to be out there on YouTube that day. And what we, where, the beauty of YouTube is, uh, that we can do that just time constraints of TV you can't do is we can provide all kinds of additional content about the equipment we use, the logistics of how we, how we got the tag, why we did this, why we did that, how we planned the hunt, wh whatever we think is relevant to the audience. And uh, so uh, we've got a couple of those, what I call them, hub content or ancillary videos already cut. And we're, we're going to load those up <clears throat> so that when you watch the episode on YouTube, you'll be able to just click and, and watch some of these other uh, additional pieces of content that give you a, a bit more behind the scenes stuff. Uh, but I'd really like your opinions about what else you want to see uh, or, or be able to watch after that episode's over. So again, <clears throat> go out to YouTube, uh, or go out to the hunt talk forum. And if you would, uh, give us your ideas of, of things you'd want to see. And when I got into this day by day thing, I skipped over a part here that if I don't choke to death on this water, I'm going to try cover these pieces. <sighs> um, I, I started to say about the tools that we use and they're all digital tools. <clears throat> I, I try to think about how hard it would have been to learn elk hunting back when I was, <laughs> when I was still almost gray. Uh, there's just so much digital resource available to us now that just makes hunting in general, elk hunting specifically, so much easier to get up to speed on. I, I think anyhow, and maybe it's just the way I use it or the way I become dependent on it. But, uh, I told you that I'm going to be going over to Missoula, Montana here in the next week and shooting some video segments about, uh, the, the new hunt app that Onyx maps has, has put out there. And <coughs> I'm, I'm bringing my GPS over there in all of my waypoints that I have saved on my laptop. Uh, and we're going to do a bunch of stuff, uh, down in their laboratory. And we're going to show you, I'm gonna, I want to have the real pros there with me because if you're like me, you never read the owner's manual. You just jump in and you try to figure it out. So I'm sure the way that I'm doing things on stuff, their tech guys are going to be like, oh my gosh, we got this guy talking about our product. You see how many steps he went through to do what he could have done by one step? <laughs> so that's that's why I'm going to go over there and shoot the video there. Is a, I don't want to be showing our audience some backwards way of doing it when there's a really easy way to do it <clears throat> but onyx maps is eh, i and you guys have heard me talk about this so many times but it, i use it for uh, my application and people are like well why would you use that what 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 difference does that make in determining where you're going to apply well when you need as many tags as we do to do the tv show I need tags more than I need what I call glory hunts. I I can't stand on the sidelines and try to accumulate eight points here and 14 points there in hopes I draw a tag. <clears throat> I got to find the places that are the easiest to draw. And across the West, the places that usually have the easier, easier draw odds, everything else being equal, are the places that have access challenges. Maybe it's checkerboard. Maybe it's just these weird configurations of, okay, <clears throat> the good part of the elk unit is out there, but you got to walk through this long sliver to get there. Uh, maybe the the state agency says, you know, we don't suggest people apply there unless they, unless they have access or an outfitter or blah, blah, blah. And uh, all that comes into play and it, it all makes sense. But for me, I'm looking at my Onyx maps and I'm here at my computer and if I find a unit that has good draw odds first thing I do is I go over there and see okay why does that have good draw odds and most often <clears throat> when I look at my Onyx map 
I can point to why it has good draws. It has tough access. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, I use Onyx Maps for that. I use it for you know so many other things. All you guys know how you can import all of your <clears throat> Google, whether it's your place marks, your trails, your your everything else. There's there's so much you can do there to overlay everything in Onyx Maps that I. It, it's kind of the starting point for everything I do. <clears throat> Google Earth, uh, I, I use it a lot just because a lot of times it's quicker. Um, it's not polluted with all my waypoints. Uh, eh, sometimes it is, uh, not always. But Google Earth gives, I, I've just grown up since Google Earth started. I, I don't know when they started, but I've been using it for so long that it's almost become this crutch for me <clears throat> where... You know, whether it's bird's eye view or all the different views you can have, <clears throat> you can change the imagery date. This is one that I thought everybody did this. And then I was out on Hunt Talk the other day and somebody posted a comment about how, you know, all the water holes on Google Earth are dry. And I think they were talking about Arizona and Arizona has a monsoon season. Well, monsoon season is July, August, September for the most part. And I suspect the person had their imagery date set in Google Earth to be February or May or something. I always, when I'm doing Google Earth, I go and set my imagery date to match the season date that I'm going to be there. So if I'm going to be there hunting in September and it's in a place with the monsoon season, I want my imagery date to be September because that's going to show me after, you know, the monsoon's been going on for six or eight weeks, it's going to show me where the water holes are. It's going to show me the places that, you know, have greened up more than other places. So, <clears throat> it, 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 and there's guys who are like, I, I'm such an amateur at Google Earth compared to some other guys I know. I don't even want to start down the path about how they use it because I'd get lost before I even got out of the parking lot trying to walk their path. But point is, Google Earth huge huge part of what i do and what i use and then uh <clears throat> gohunt.com you heard me talk about in the intro the the promotion that they have well i've only had their system now for i think they let me look at it I'm trying to think almost two years now i've had it and it's just especially in my application season it's huge in my application season because it's got so much information that comes into my planning of where I'm going to draw and what I'm going to do. Uh, <clears throat> draw odds. It's, is, you know, it has its evaluation of, you know, what kind of animals, trophy class, harvest statistics. It's, it's, it's more information than, than you can process in one sit down session. But then even when you draw your tag, there's tons and tons of information in there about, you know, it, it's got maps. It's got where campgrounds are. It's got <clears throat> trends and ideas. And then you go into each of the states. It has a whole bunch of stuff there about each of the states. It's it's just a super, super useful resource for me. So those are the three tools that I use for this desk scouting. Absolutely just couldn't do without it sort of tools and then the fourth one is just you know i own a very large uh web forum called hunt talk and the the guys out on hunt talk they are i go out there i, I mean i'm out there all the time obviously and when hunting season comes around these guys and these are all self-guided public land dudes who are out there you look at the pictures those guys post of the animals, the quality of the animals that they kill every year. And I feel like I'm just so, so much an amateur compared to a lot of those guys. And the reason I say this is I use that hunt talk forum for, you know, and I, <clears throat> there's kind of a way to go about it. You don't show up and your first post say, hey, I drew a tag in Unit 44 in Colorado. Anyone got any information? You're probably not, <laughs> not going to get much help. If you show up and say, hey, 
I drew a tag in Unit 44 in Colorado. I've looked at this and this and this and this, and I've talked to this person and this person and this person. Anyone willing to send me a private message to confirm if I'm heading down the wrong trail? Shows that you've done your own homework. Shows that you're you're interested in, in helping and sharing and being part of the community. These forums, and, and I'm talking about my forum, Hunt Talk, but there's some other forums out there if you're a bow hunter, uh, you know, I hang out regularly on a, a forum called Bowsite. Uh, Pat and Charlie over there have a great forum. And uh, I just, uh, I find Hunt Talk because it's specific to our style of hunting, the self-guided public land hunter. That's all that we talk about on, on Hunt Talk. Uh, it's just, it's really helpful. You can go back, search all the old threads. You can see, okay, a lot of times it's by state, it's by species, it's by hunt type. Um, and as a general rule, uh, the hunt talk crowd wants to see other people succeed. And they'll they'll be very, very helpful. Um, there's always, like every forum, you know, someone's going to have a bad day. So if someone's giving you a bad time, let me know. <laughs> uh, uh, I've, I've probably, they've probably given me a bad time along the way too. So, <clears throat> but anyhow. It's, it's not a research tool per se to get my map all prepared and get my game plan all prepared. Um, but it's, it's very helpful as a sounding board, just am I heading down the right path? You'll meet some people who've probably hunted that area before if, if you interact with them properly. And we all know that if you can talk to someone who's been in that unit with your season date or your weapon type, that is super valuable information. If someone's willing to share that with you, please figure out a way to pay them back. It's that that kind of stuff is just super helpful. So anyhow, I I hope that this whole process here of explaining this and it, it came up through a series of questions that I got uh, via email and on Hunt Talk because I, I kind of started down this path at one time, but I never I don't feel like I really finished it up as good as I could have. So hopefully this time we we've covered it thoroughly. And if you got more questions on it, uh, please go out to hunt talk and, and post it in the podcast forum or post, podcast thread out on the forum. Um, and then I, I'm hoping that, uh, when we're doing all this YouTube stuff, <clears throat> it's a lot of work. Uh, but it's, it's something I'm passionate about because it's so much good information. Uh, if you go out there to the YouTube channel, Randy Newberg Hunter, you can watch all of our old episodes from when we started this on your own adventures for four years. And now the last four years, getting ready to do the fifth year of fresh tracks. All those episodes are out there. The elk talk series that we're doing with the Rocky mountain elk foundation is out there. Oh, and, uh, even though all the tag drawings are pretty much done, there's a video out there in the Elk Talk series <clears throat> called Over the Counter Leftover and General Tags. I'm always amazed at how many people say, oh, I didn't draw a tag. I'm not going elk hunting. Hold on. <laughs> Go elk hunting. That video out there in the Elk Talk series will tell you here are three states that have excellent elk hunting have over-the-counter or leftover or general tag opportunities that you should take advantage of. I, I, I just, it bothers me to see people not go elk hunting each year when that's part of their dream. You, you can do it. Don't, don't listen to the naysayers. I, I look at the elk that are killed in these states a lot of times on general tags. And there's some great bulls killed. And even if it's not a great bull, you know what? Any public land bull is a trophy. I get so excited when I shoot a bull. I don't care how big it is or if it's just a raghorn. I'm jumping up and down, hooting and yelling. It's it's just a big, well, it's why we do it, I hope, just to be out there and, and be part of it. So Idaho, Montana, and Colorado, right now as I'm recording this podcast in early June, you could go out right now and buy a tag to hunt any of those three states. If you decide you're going to sit home and not elk hunt this year, that's fine. But it's not because they're, all the tags are gone. It's because someone made the decision of, oh, I just I don't want to do that this year. So 
The other thing we have out on the Elk Talk or out on the the YouTube channel is we've just started the series. We we've launched uh, video number four in a series that we're calling uh, "Stealing Your Public Lands," and I I titled it that because I feel strongly that this whole idea that is in Congress right now in the state legislatures of the West. They call it state transfer, that they want to transfer the land to the states. Uh, it's really an effort to steal your public lands. That's all it is. It's, uh, they can call it what they want. Um, <clears throat> and some of you have, have heard me talk about it on previous podcasts of ours. Uh, the Brian and the guys over at the Greedy Bowman, uh, man, we had a really great, <laughs> I think we talked for almost two hours on this topic. And, uh, we, one of our episodes, we dedicated specifically to the entire idea of what this state transfer is, is all about. Uh, again, like I said, they call it state transfer. I think it's episode 10. So if you go to go out to Stitcher or iTunes, um, or even on our YouTube channel, we have all of the podcasts loaded up also there. You can, you can listen to them on YouTube. There's no video with them, <clears throat> but, uh, episode 10, me and Dan Doty, uh, spent about an, I don't know, hour, hour and 10 minutes talking about this whole, uh, steal your public lands, land transfer, state transfer idea. And I've, I've, like I said, we're, we, we've produced 15 videos on the topic because it's a very complicated topic. You know, unfortunately the other side, the, the people who want to get rid of your lands, they have the easy speech. They can just say, oh, the damn feds. And everyone, our default is like, yeah, <laughs> damn feds. We who are trying to defend the public lands have to craft a message. So it's taken me 15 episodes on YouTube. And we're releasing them every Wednesday. So we're on number four right now. And over the course of that, I talk about the history of this, how we got here. How, how some of the myths are being floated out there that sound good on the surface, but when when you peel back the covers, they, they sound really bad. Uh, then we go into the history of how these states have been selling the public lands. Uh, nobody wants to talk about that. They kind of make it sound like, oh, everything will be fine. When, when we're done, you'll realize that state trust lands are completely different than BLM and U.S. Forest Service federal lands. And again, you've, you've heard me talk about this, but just for those who don't know, the state trust lands of the West, and we talk about this in, I think, episode number two of this series, the state trust lands are lands that the states received when they were granted statehood. And the federal government, some of them, they said, all right, we're going to give you two out of every 36 square miles. Some of them, they said, we're going to give you four out of every 36 square miles. But the federal government said, we're going to give you these. This is your, you know, what you use to, to fund your schools, to, to raise money for education in your state. Because in your Enabling Act, an Enabling Act is the legislation that Congress passes to admit a state to the union. In your Enabling Act, you're giving up right to all these other lands within your borders. And so a lot of people <clears throat> just think that, oh, federal public lands are going to be the same if they end up in state land boards. Um, I, I'm out here right now, uh, on the Arizona state land board website on the, on the very first page where you click on recreation, uh, partway down the page, the very first bulleted point says Arizona trust land is managed by the state land department. Trust land is not public land exclamation point. That's what they say out there. So I don't know. I think there's 10 million acres of, no, way more than that. I think there's 9 million of state land in Arizona, but there's like 20 some million of federal BLM and forest service land in Arizona. So let, let's just walk through that. We transfer, <clears throat> we get duped into transferring all this BLM and forest service land in Arizona to the state of Arizona and it gets managed by their state land board. Uh, they have a big big notice right on their website. Trust land is not public land. The next bullet point says a recreation permit is required to camp, hike, or travel 
on trust land. And then it says, here are the types of recreational permits. Your individual permit is $15 a year. Your family permit is $20 a year. And then they go in and talk about, okay, there's a lot of trespassing that goes on on state lands. And I'm like, <clears throat> trespassing? They're serious about this. This is not public land. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so you click on that tab out on their site. And the, at the bottom of the page, there's a big sign that says state trust land, no trespassing. <laughs> Call phone number 602-542-2119. <laughs> I probably shouldn't read that phone number because that person's going to get 100 phone calls tomorrow morning. But uh, really, that's what it says. <clears throat> if you go out to the, it's land.az.gov, and you click on the tab that says Natural Resources, I would encourage everyone to click on the Trespass Program tab. This is This is so hilarious. I had to include it in the video when we talked about Arizona. <clears throat> what state transfer would mean. And I'm going to read this to you because if you're listening to this driving down the road, you're going to shake your head and say, are you kidding me? So here's what it says. It says trespass program. In Arizona, Attorney General's opinion number 74-13 sets forth that, <clears throat> and they put it in quotation marks, no one may enter state trust land without a permit, period. I'm going to read that again. In Arizona, Attorney General's opinion, da-da-da, sets forth that, in quotation marks, nobody may enter upon state trust land without a permit. So think about that. We got all these tens of millions of acres of Forest Service and BLM land that we can just go do whatever we want right now. Uh, we don't have to pay a $15 individual permit or a $20 annual family permit. We just go do what we want. <clears throat> and so here's what the... <laughs> This is the part that makes me laugh. <clears throat> the next sentence says, like many crimes, now they're, they're going to get into this high crime here that they're referring to. Like many crimes, illegal occupancy of state trust land ranges from minor to major offenses, period. Now li listen to this sentence. Now, I hope you're not driving down the road because you might get in a wreck when I read this next sentence. Even people walking their dog on trust land in their community must have a permit, comma, in this case, a recreational use permit. And if you click on that, you get to go pay your $20 a year to walk your dog. <coughs> uh, I'm like, really? The, the, that's what the state trust land department is worried about in Arizona? That constitutes trespassing? I've trespassed on state land if I do not have a recreational use permit to walk my dog. I'm not making this up, folks. You, this is this is a real deal. I, I mean, so many people want to act like I I've, I'm making this crap up. I'm not. I'm reading it right from their website. So, and, and then I want to get into the. Uh, this other thing, and for those of us who love to shoot like I do, I mean, I've got so many rifles and shotguns and I don't know how much loaded ammunition I have in this house, but if ATF ever shows up, they're going to probably have some suspicions about what kind of person I am. So uh, it, it then goes on to say, trespass investigators, I, I assume they're referring to people who uh, uh, keep all the trespassers off these state trust lands in Arizona, uh, trespass investigators also respond to numerous other concerns, everything from OHV complaints, dust, squatters, cemeteries, historic issues, trash, environmental issues, which I get all that. I mean, I, I hope people aren't doing stupid things on federal lands for any of those things. And then this one, target shooting. Trespass investigators respond to concerns about target shooting. And I've been all over the Arizona website, and I've been trying to find, do you let me do recreational target shooting in Arizona on state trust lands? And I cannot find where it's allowed. Uh, I know it's prohibited in my home state of Montana uh, on state trust lands. It's prohibited in many of the other states on their state trust lands. So right now, you think about... <clears throat> I don't know what we have in the West. I think you know, uh, we got 
hundreds of millions of acres of land in the West that is open right now if you want to go shoot. I hope if you go and shoot, you aren't one of those knuckleheads. No, I know you're not. I hope if you go and shoot, you don't encounter some of those knuckleheads who bring the TV and the couch and the the dishwasher and everything else, go out there and use it for a target and leave it out there. That stuff chaps my hide. And right now across the West, because of all the littering that's happening with some of these knotheads doing target shooting, the BLM and the Forest Service is having to close some small areas. Um, and that, that, that in itself is frustrating. But imagine if we transferred these hundreds of millions of acres of BLM and Forest Service land to these state land boards. And I, I, <clears throat> maybe some of these states allow it, but I've been researching this for years. I cannot find a single state. I know Colorado doesn't allow it. I can't find a single state that allows recreational target shooting on state trust lands. You can go do that on BLM and Forest Service right now. So anyhow, this is a a bit of a tangent that uh, uh, the way I got into it here is talking about this YouTube series we have called, and there's a playlist out there called Public Land Issues. And if you click on that playlist, you're going to see all these videos we're, we're loading up there about. And if you see the title that starts with Stealing Your Public Lands, uh, those are the ones that are about these knotheads in Congress who, <clears throat> and, and I talk about this in, I think, video number four, I talk about the cost of managing these lands. And that, that kind of gets to the heart of the idea. Uh, Some of you may not know that when these state land boards, how they're established is they're either by constitution or by state statute. They're set up to manage lands properly for the schools. And if the states cannot manage them for a profit, they have to get rid of them. Well, the states, all the economists know that the states cannot manage these for a profit. So here's the strategy of those people who want to screw you out of your public lands. Let's transfer them from federal ownership to state ownership. The states can't afford them because their revenues will be too low or their costs will be too high. And by statute or by constitution, they're going to have to sell them. Mission accomplished. Then we, we, we've accomplished the goal of getting rid of public lands in America. It's really that simple. And uh, <clears throat> that's, <laughs> that's what they're trying to do. So we've done a whole series about this. And once we get through the introduction series, I think it's the first five videos, then we get into state-by-state videos. Because a lot of people will argue with me, oh, I can hunt state lands in Colorado. No, you can't go to their website. It says state trust lands are not public lands in Colorado. It will say right on their website, recreational access to state lands in Colorado is not the same as it is for federal lands. Hunting is by the default position on hunting in Colorado is you cannot hunt on state land in Colorado unless arrangements have been made by fit their department of parks and wildlife which they can't afford to lease all those lands, or if you can get permission from the person who's leasing it, which usually that's that's very difficult. <clears throat> so just in Colorado, we use that example because it's so blatant. You know, you got 23 million acres of U.S. Forest Service and BLM lands that right now we can hunt them, fish them, camp, hike, do whatever. And under this state transfer idea, you give those 23 million acres to the state of Colorado land board and we're done. You are not hunting those 23 million acres. You're not camping them, fishing it, hiking it, whatever. And so <clears throat> that's the whole idea behind this notion of state transfer. They, they want to get these lands out of your hands by hook or by crook. And, uh, this whole series called Stealing Your Public Lands is by the time we're done, by the time we're through all 15 episodes, I <laughs> I hope it's a resource for those of you who get in arguments with the knotheads of the world, the, the ideologues who say, well, I voted for the guy and that's what he's supporting, so I'm in favor of it. If you're a hunter and you are supporting 
state transfer, you may as well go and support PETA. State transfer is the biggest anti-hunting effort that I know of going on right now in our country. It just, it's the way it is. I, I mean, you think of how many hundreds of millions of acres of access we're going to lose to hunting under quote unquote state transfer. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm hoping when we're all done with it, we've convinced a lot of people to think about it more. We've provided some, some ammunition. Oh, can I say that? Yeah. We provided some ammunition for those who are engaged in these uh, debates on the topic. So I'm getting close to wrapping up here. A couple thoughts I, w- I want from all of you is I'm interested in who you want as future uh, podcast guests and podcast topics. Uh, later next week, I'm going to be uh, at a big conference with a lot of media people. It's called POMA, the Professional Outdoor Media Association. And there's a lot of cool people there who I'm trying to coordinate schedules so we can do some podcasts. Uh, and they're busy, I'm busy, so it's always one of those struggles of whether or not we'll be able to make it work. But uh, if you have ideas of people or topics, uh, let me know. I'm. Uh, you guys have heard me touch on some of the grizzly bear stuff and how involved I've been in that for the last 20 years. I'm, I'm actually trying to get some some people on the podcast who... Hey, I know they'd feel like they're walking into a an ambush, and I don't want it to be that way. But I'd like to have some people on who maybe have a different perspective about grizzly bear delisting than I have. Um, I I always think that having debate with people who hold different views and different perspectives, I think that's always helpful. And uh, I'd love to do that. I, I'd like to have someone on here about that. So. It don't don't think that whoever you suggest to us for a guest has to be somebody who's a a hunter or somebody who you know does what I do. I I always want other opinions. I I think if we just sit and listen to ourselves and listen to our buddies, uh, a lot of times it's it's nothing but an echo, and we don't don't learn as much as we otherwise could. So, <clears throat> and I guess I'm going to wrap it up with. Uh, you know, the uh, the tag drawings are just about done other than right now I think I'm waiting on, well, Montana I'm pretty sure is going to send me a sheep tag for the Missouri River breaks. Uh, I'm due. Uh, and all you guys who've been waiting longer than I have, I've been applying. This is my 25th year of applying. Uh, you're probably saying, wait, Newberg, you're still on the back of the line. Uh, so let's see. we got Montana moose goat and sheep and antelope yet to come. We have Idaho deer, elk, and antelope yet to come. Wyoming deer and antelope yet to come. And Arizona deer and sheep. I think everything else is done. Utah, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Wyoming elk. Uh, the big three of moose, goat, and sheep in Idaho is done. Uh, Montana elk and deer is done. So <clears throat> our... Uh, our schedule is starting to fill in and it causes these emails that we get where people say, well, uh, what, what determines where you guys go, where you hunt, what, what you film, what you do. And, uh, it's, it's driven by quite a few things. Um, obviously we want to do stuff that we, we want to feature hunts that the traveling hunter is going to find interesting, whether we shoot something or not, we want to make sure it has appeal to, to the viewer who travels the West to hunt. And, and that ends up making it heavily focused on elk. Uh, we usually of our 10, 12 episodes a year, we try to have five to six elk hunts, um, some deer hunts, uh, usually sprinkle in an antelope hunt or two, a bear hunt or two. Um, just because that's, that's the stuff that our audience who are the self-guided public land hunter, that's what they're coming out to do. So I get a lot of cool invitations. You know, I got one today. Hey, Randy, you want to come down to Florida and go gator hunting? I do, but one, schedule, two, does it fit kind of our gig? Uh, could I provide much information on a hunt like that, something I've never done that I don't understand the logistics where someone's probably going to have to almost hold my hand and show me the path? Uh, so that's kind of what a, a bit of what goes into it. Uh we also look at it and say, all right, this year do we have too many or too few of this species or too many or too few of this weapon type or 
have we been in this state way too much in the last three or four years? So it's, it's a whole list of things. And <clears throat> some of the states, it's really a, I don't know if bad investment is the right word, but the cost to opportunity ratio on some of the states is not very good. And so people say, Randy, why have you never been to California or Oregon or Washington? Uh, nothing against those states. There's some great hunting in all those states. But as a non-resident, usually your cost to opportunity or your cost to expected opportunity is much higher than the other states that we feature. So I still want to go hunt Roosevelt elk. I still want to go hunt Columbia blacktails. So somehow I'm getting to either California uh, Washington or Oregon to go get those ones off my bucket list someday. So hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of an idea about what goes into why we film and what we film. And then, uh, <clears throat> this year it's, it's looking like we're going to be hunting deer. Well, I know we're going to be hunting deer in Montana, Utah, and Nevada, cause we already have those tags. Uh, and I've put in for a place in Idaho that I know I'm going to get the tag as a second choice if I don't draw my first choice. So I, it's just, is that going to fit our schedule? Um, and then Wyoming, I, I'm hoping I draw my second choice. I don't know if I will, but I, I think I will. And then uh, this winter, I've, I've tried to do this for years and years, but I don't know if people understand that you can go to Arizona and a lot of their cows deer i'm going to say it correctly cows even though most people call it coos deer uh and a lot of their mule deer units in december part of december and part of january are over the counter archery hunts i'm i'm going down there when it gets cold up here in montana i know sometime this winter i'm going down there to do that also so that's going to be another deer hunt uh as far as elk uh we're going to be in montana uh, Colorado, I burnt 19 points in Colorado this year, so I better, better make the most of that. And then in New Mexico, uh, gosh, we drew a couple of really good tags, uh, for me and a party app. And then we've got a friend who has a really good tag. And then we've got the sweepstakes hunter. Uh, we, last year we drew a person who we're going to take on a hunt this year. Uh, so we've got some elk hunts in, in New Mexico and, uh, Montana, Colorado. I, <clears throat> I think that'll kind of tap us out on elk hunts this year. Uh, I do have an Alaska bear tag, so good chance I might be back up there again this year. So that's, that's kind of the stuff. <clears throat> uh, when you, when you hear what that is, we, we call it the whiteboard and occasionally we post a picture of the whiteboard out on hunt talk so that everyone can see what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, the last thing, uh, we've been getting a lot of requests from people now that we have the YouTube channel saying, Hey, why don't you go do some duck hunts or go do some grouse hunts or, you know, predators or whatever. I do all that kind of hunting when I'm not on TV. Uh, I, I love every bit of that. Uh, so out on YouTube, uh, maybe not on our TV stuff, but on our YouTube stuff, there's a really good chance you're going to start seeing us do more of these segments about just short little hunts, you know, rabbit hunting or coyote hunting or wolf hunting, whatever it might be. So anyhow, <clears throat> I've kept you guys a long time here, and I've, I've actually still got a lot more questions that I copied and pasted off the Hunt Talk forum, but I'm just, I'm not going to get to them all. Uh, you guys have probably fallen asleep by now anyhow. So, but I want to thank you a lot for listening. Uh, I hope I can pull together some of these guests that I've, I've been promised that they will be on the podcast in the next month. Uh, or at least we'll record it in the next month when the podcast will air. I don't know, but, uh, anyhow, uh, thanks for, for listening. Thanks for supporting all that we do. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, our Hunt Talk Forum, uh, YouTube, or if you want to know about all of our platforms, there's one hub there where all these folks can be found, and that is randynewberg.com. Thanks for listening. You have a great day, and I hope that this hunting season is your best season ever. 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 Season ever.